Someone said they, I was asked if I wanted to preach this morning. I said, sure, I'd be glad to fill in. So this is multiple choice this morning. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that on Mother's Day, I preached to the fathers. On Father's Day, I had sermons for the mothers. So we have a multiple choice of sermons that you can choose from this morning before I start. (laughs) Pull this out of the archives. This is how husbands are to be treated. (laughs) This one is how wives are to be treated, how you're to love your wife. Or this is the text we had this morning. (laughs) I did learn last Sunday, God bless you brother, that he said this congregation enjoyed short sermons, so I might suggest this would be the one you go with. (laughs) How is your going going? Does that sound familiar? Well, that's the title of this short sermon. (laughs) I'm learning more and more each Sunday I come. Sometimes I get a chance to read the gospel or the text that we're going to preach out of. Sometimes I don't. Today I didn't get to. That's fine because I heard that there was a few other things that you folks said before and after that text was read that I obviously have not listened to much because I didn't remember that. So that's good. You wiped out my short sermon and made it shorter, so I don't have to read the text. (laughs) Before I begin the message this morning, I'd like to assure each one of you that this may be the last time I get to preach, because you're looking at pastors to come in and do a good job be here all the time. I enjoy preaching, but for Father's Day, I took my wife to Des Moines. And when we got there, she said, what are you going to get me? (laughs) I got a call that had to come all the way back home again because we were called out last night. I got home about 1 o'clock in the morning, storm in Ottumwa, uh, knocked out half of the south side of Ottumwa. I was getting calls to get water out of houses. It was coming through the roofs. I would say a th- between three out of every four calls that I was receiving wanted me to somehow cover the roof to keep the water from coming through. <laughs> and when I got there, the tree limbs were still sticking in the roof. And it was like, mm, uh. I don't think I can help you because, number one, there's no electricity. Number two, I didn't bring a chainsaw (laughs) or a ladder. So uh, we just dealt with the homes that um, uh, had water in the basement. But I I want you to know this morning that because you are here on this Father's Day, and I'm still becoming more familiar with each one of you, so if you're visiting this morning... I say a special thank you for coming and being part of this service, even though I'm not the pastor. I just fill in once in a while, and I do enjoy it. For those that regularly attend, you're getting a little more used to me, and that's good for me. may not be so good for you, but it's good for me because I'm enjoying myself each Sunday I get to share. But I want to assure each of you this morning that this is probably the safest place that you could have chosen to be a part of and stay in in any other place in the world. And I have statistics to prove it. Ready? Here we go. 20% of all fatal accidents occur in the car, automobile. 17% of accidents happen in the home. 16% of accidents involve either the air, the water, or the railroad, or rails. 14% of the accidents happen to pedestrians. 
It might be rising now that people text and... <laughs> I'm sure the person is not here today, but down at the stop sign down here, I sat, it felt like 15 minutes, but there was a car sitting at stop sign, no cars coming either way on Highway 1, and she was busy texting something. I'm in my yellow van, so I have to be careful of my <laughs> responses. You know, it's a little tough to get irate when you have the name of your company on the side of the truck. <laughs> so I sat very patiently and finally she realized there was someone behind her and, she <laughs> and then went on. So maybe more pedestrians are going to get hit because people are texting or on their phone. But I want you to listen very closely. According to the statistics, only point zero zero. 1%, that is one thousandths of 1% of all deaths occur in the worship service. <laughs> and those that do die usually have a physical ailment that they've been struggling with. It was not, believe me, from the sermon or the pastor. So you have chosen a very safe place to be at this moment in time. <laughs> good. You're really getting good at that. I appreciate that. The measure of success. The measure of, success of, of a person's success is not whether you have a tough problem to deal with, but rather it's whether that, that same problem that you had last year is the same one you're dealing with this year. In order to be successful, we need to be dealing with the problems that we face. If you want to be a winner, everyone wants to be a winner, I mean, um, I need to be careful I don't get on too many side rabbit trails here, but you go to a ball game and everybody's a winner. Oh, we don't keep score. I was watching, a, not a little league, but the little peewee people that play, and they hit it off the bat or hit it off the little stand in the center and whatever else, and they run, and everybody gets the bat and that. And they kept asking the coaches, who's ahead, who's ahead? We're all ahead. We're all winners. I heard one of the kids say, that's what he thinks, we're losers. <laughs> <laughs> they have more runs than we do. <laughs> and we go around and we want everyone to be a winner. Well, winners say, let's find out. Losers say, nobody cares. Winners make, when a winner makes a mistake, he says, I was wrong. Losers say, it wasn't my fault. A winner goes through a problem. Losers try to go around it, but they never get around it. Winners say, I'm good, but not as good as I could be. Losers say, I'm not as bad as other people. <laughs> Winners make commitments. Losers make promises. I will complete those tasks at home, dear. I'm committed to it. <laughs> Winners try to learn from those who are superior to them. Losers tear down those who are superior to them. A winner says there ought to be a better way to do it. Losers say the way, that's the way it's always been done. The text that you read this morning, if you read the whole chapter, you see that Jesus was telling some parables. And the first part of that, he tells 
a parable that you and I are very familiar with, and then our text this morning kind of builds a little deeper or builds on that as a foundation. But he says there's, and my brother, I know, today we plant our crops. <laughs> but in the biblical sense, they always sowed. They always went out. They didn't have all the nice machinery they had. I thought that was quite unique that it's good because we have progressed as far as being able to do it. But you know, the, the, the standards are still the same. And our text this morning talks about that. But Jesus was saying, a sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing the seed, some fell on good ground, some fell on stony ground, and some fell to the wayside. And then Jesus explains how when the Word of God is preached, when you have the opportunity to hear the Word of God, when you have the opportunity to be a part of a church service, and no matter how good the preacher is, no matter what the text is, if it's built upon the Word of God, some of that which we speak forth is going to fall on those people that can't wait to get out of here. But I'm telling you, this is the safest place to stay. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Some falls on the stony ground and it takes root, but it just doesn't, it's not able to get deep down into the soil. So when it was, as it has been the last couple of weeks, it gets burnt. It dries up. It dies. Some fell onto the good soil. And even in the parched time, it was able to rid itself deep down in the Word of God and survive and make it. Some fell to the wayside. It got a good root. But something came along. The scripture talks about the cares of the world. came along and clipped it off. Broke it. Crunched it down. I don't know if tranched is a good word, but it's trounch and, you know, that's, that's kind of the way sometimes it comes out. But the Word of God, as it was being given forth, falls on different people's lives and they receive it in different ways. Then we come to the text that we used this morning and Jesus begins to once again pick up from that thought and he begins to talk about how that word begins to grow. You see, when it begins to get, when it's planted or sowed, and it gets into that soil, now I, I'm, I'm losing my hearing, but even when I had somewhat good hearing, Dad would sit on the porch, and I never got to live on a farm. Dad had a farm and is on a farm now, but when I was a boy, the oldest of the family, house burnt down, and we never did get to move on to it. But I worked a lot of hours on the farm back when you had H's and M's and Super M's and those kind. There was no cabs, no air conditioning. Sometimes I got the tractor that didn't have a stuffed seat on it. <laughs> the only stuffed seat was my own. But we'd go out and we'd farm and we'd till and we'd plant. And Jesus is telling us here in this text that, as what my dad would say, sit down, son. And the sun would begin to set in the sky. And he said, listen, especially on a humid day, he said, listen, can you hear that corn growing? Can you hear it snapping? It's snapping. It's growing. It's sprouting. Okay, Dad. <laughs> if you say so. Jesus tells us this parable, and he's beginning to speak in the parable, and he says, you know what? When you plant a seed, when you plant that seed, you don't... You may be cultivating, you may be out swimming, you may be 
buying groceries, you may be doing a lot of different things, but that seed is maturing and growing, and when it begins to sprout from the seed, begins to come up in a stalk, the stalk begins to bring forth the stalk, or the, the head, the head begins to develop a kernel, and then that kernel, you begin to come to the point of realizing, hey, hey, you know what? I got a harvest. It's time to get the combines out, get the pickers out. It's time to bring in the harvest. And Jesus is saying, in that relationship of growth, how do you view your salvation? What is being saved? What is the purpose of attending this safe place? What is the purpose of coming to church? What is the purpose of serving God? What is the purpose? Do you see that there is a goal? And it's not just that everybody, may, someone may look at you and say, hey, you know, hey, he's a pretty good guy. He goes to church. He goes to the word of life. He was describing both the results of preaching the gospel and the spiritual conditions that will surround mankind until the end of the age. These portions of parables in Mark tell us interesting facts about our salvation. Now I have to skip a whole bunch in my sermon because we've already read the text, okay? You remember what it is? Your success depends upon you. It depends upon you. What was my statement in the beginning of this message? The measure of success is not whether you have a problem, it's whether that problem still exists a year later. Jesus in the prior verses of this chapter is dealing with incomplete conversions. Now, I hope I don't get too deep because I don't think it's that deep, but hang on with me on this Father's Day. If it gets too deep, I'll go back to how husbands should be treated or how wives should be treated, okay? <laughs> I also understand, and I'm glad you didn't give a time period for the elders or the uh, search committee to meet in the back. He just said, after the service is finished, okay? <laughs> so hang on. What the Lord is talking about here is when people seek forgiveness, when they seek forgiveness, oh, I'll never do that again. Have you ever heard that? If you're a mom or a pa, you've heard it a lot. I won't do it again. I promise. But there's not much commitment to it. Why is there not a whole lot of commitment to it? Because there's not a lot of experience yet. Hello? And the older they get, we get, the more experience we have. Regeneration is recreating and transforming a person by the Spirit of God. I've pastored for a lot of years. I have been really privileged to share the Word of God with you in a fellowship of believers that I have never been a part of before. And I've shared that with you many times. And I am so appreciative of that because you've given me a unique insight. And sometimes we see through just a tunnel and we see through glasses the Scripture talks about that are dark. Lenses that are kind of foggy. And we think that our way is the only way. Well, the fact is, there is only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have eternal life. But we may have different forms of worship, but as long as He is the center of our worship, praise God, you have shared that with me, and I appreciate that. But our salvation is an ongoing experience. You didn't become a Lutheran and say, Hey, hey man, I arrived. <laughs> I didn't go to a Pentecostal church and say, Glory, glory, I have found the corner of the market. Or any other denomination that you want to name this morning. 
The fact is that our salvation is an ongoing experience. I need a... <laughs> and because it's an ongoing experience means that we have to work with it on a daily basis, just not on Father's Day or Mother's Day or Christmas or Easter. I think I'm just naming those holidays where people show up. It's an everyday experience. And because we do not bring ourselves together in a fellowship with other Christians, we struggle with our salvation. And that is the stony ground and the wayside ground. The fertile ground keeps getting cultivated. Now, sometimes people get a little aggravated at me because I act childish sometimes. But good old black dirt. I mean the good, rich stuff. Does it say, plow through me again? Oh. <laughs> Chisel plow me one more time. <laughs> Go ahead and spray that stuff on me. <laughs> but the more we cultivate the ground, the more we till it, the more we let it breathe. Um, another rabbit trail. One guy came to my father and he said, hey, we've got this special stuff that will help your fields. It will improve it. It helps the worms and, and the, the, the bugs and worms and that in the ground to come up through the ground and break the soil. We don't have to worry about that. What do you mean you don't have you, you need this stuff because people spray a lot. No, we don't have to have it. You can go out in our field and you can see because we rotate our crops, we plow our ground, we've got... You go out there anytime and you can see where the earthworms and that are coming up through the ground and breaking the soil. It needs to breathe. In our own relationship with God, there are things that we face and struggles that we go through to get us to think, to get us to ponder, to get us to realize that maybe the choices we are making are not exactly the ones we should be making. Regeneration involves a transition from the old life of sin to a new life of obedience. Let me ask you this. When people come to church, are they engaged in a conversation with us about the things of God? If they become involved in a conversation with you, are you giving them proper understanding of the gospel? Or are you a loser and say, that's just the way we always do it? When someone asks you a question about why you do things that you do, are you able to give them a proper understanding and the foundation into why we do the things we do? I have shared with you, I appreciate that moment that you have. Let's have a moment of silence and let's think about the things that we have done when you're at the stop sign and somebody's not moving. <laughs> Did you keep your Christian ethics on the shelf or in your heart? Did you stop instead of saying in an aggravated way, mm, if you don't get going, I'm going to push you out of the way. Or did you say, if the sign on my church, my, excuse me, if the sign on my truck was not there, I would definitely push you out of the way. <laughs> or could we stop and say, God in heaven, at this moment, she may be concentrated on texting, but God somehow reveal yourself to her that if she doesn't know you, that she'll soon find you because somebody's about ready to run into her. <laughs> and that wasn't going to be me, okay? Your success in life depends on your decisions. Are we giving a clear understanding of the demands of the Christ life? The Christ life. Life, not Stephen's life, but the Christ life. Do we have a clear understanding of the gospel? As a Christian, I'm almost finished with my sermon, believe it or not. As a Christian, there are, th 
as Christians, we need to understand that there, and I had to really work on this this morning, so I sat in my deck, on my deck, and I was kind of redoing my things, and my wife, you know, comes out and encourages me, I said, don't bother me, I need to, I need to get this right. There are three levels of salvation, and, 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 and I wasn't sure that was exactly how I wanted to say it. So I want to rephrase it, and I want to say there are three levels of perspective about our salvation, because salvation is salvation. But sometimes we need to stop, and when we think about our lives, we need to see that our lives in three different perspectives. The first is this. It includes our personal experience. I can't think of the name of the author right now. I have his book. It's not, no longer in print. I, I, he, he wrote it a long time ago. Uh, he was in, over in England. <laughs> it's about this thick and small print. And the basics of it, he talks about Christians that are having... Uh, uh, mental problems. They have discouragement and they can't seem to hang on to the things they need to hang on to make it through life. You know what he found out? Between 75 and 90 percent of the people that become discouraged after they accept Christ as the Lord and Savior were Christians that were raised in a Christian home that have been around Christianity all their life. I've never done drugs. I'm not saying that as a brag. I've never done it. I don't know what they taste like. don't know what they look like. In fact, I have opened a truck and out of it wasn't my truck, but I've opened a truck and some I thought they were looked like little beads that came out. And the guy standing next to me said, "Ooh, we got marijuana here." Oh, really? <laughs> okay. I know nothing, I see nothing. <laughs> I've never been around it, so I don't understand it. I don't know nothing about it. Christians that have always been raised in a Christian home, yes, we have sinned. Yes, we have fallen short of God's glory. But we've always been, we've always been around that idea that Christ forgives us. So in the midst of trials and tribulations, in the midst of things not going the way we feel they should be going, all of a sudden we become dis desperate and in despair and we become discouraged and we say, why, God, hey, come on, I'm your child. Come, give me a break here. Give me some benefits. And we don't get the benefits and we say, why me? Why me? I like what Pastor or Circular say, why not? <laughs> we become discouraged. Those that have been raised around Christianity all their life seem to be the ones that fall into that discouragement. And those that were not in a Christian home, that were not raised that way, when they come to the realization that Jesus Christ died for them and He renews their life and gives them that victory over sin, they find it very unique that in the midst of the struggle and the troubles and the tribulations, they can get through because they know what the life was. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? And I'm like, wow. Why? Why is it that we don't understand that that have been raised in a Christian home? Does that mean we should go out and do it? No, 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 no. But understand that as the plant matures in the ground and grows, it grows and matures up and it brings forth a harvest. Now, where is that Scripture I've talked about before? Oh yes, it's in Galatians, the sixth chapter. Let us not give up in doing good, for at the proper time we will what? Reap a harvest. It will come. And then the Scripture says, as some have done, they've given up. Because of discouragement. Last Friday I turned 63. Okay. 
okay. <laughs> so if the sermon's longer, it's because I'm slower. <laughs> now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's what happens when you turn 63. <laughs> I'm still learning. I'm still seeing things that I did not understand at 45 or at 50. Been married for 42 years. We <laughs> My wife told me not to say anything, not to ask her any questions, but aren't we having fun now? Yes, we are, aren't we? <laughs> there was a time early in my ministry where she told me she was going to leave. There was a time in my ministry where I told her I was going to leave. Because of discouragement, a feeling you were all alone. Now, when she told me she was going to leave, she was going to take our oldest boy. He was the one born. I was pastoring. She was going to take him and she was going to take all his pictures. And I said, If you're going to take him, you'll leave the pictures. She said, Well, I'm not going to leave the pictures. And then I said, You have to leave him. We decided we'd stay together. <laughs> Forty-two years working through those times of trouble and tribulation. We are having more fun now, aren't we, dear? <laughs> My point being to you folks, your salvation is not a quick cure to utopia. It is a traveling plan to become more like Jesus. To understand more of His love for you. To understand that when He planted the seed of His Son, Jesus Christ, in you, and you said, Lord, forgive me of my sin, that, sin, that seed is growing and maturing. is going to come to a point where there's going to be a great harvest. Our salvation is provided by the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. What is that first perspective? It is your past. That's where I was before I got on the rabbit trail. It's our past. Each one of us have a different past. Some of us have some really horrible past. I've had some past that I don't like to think about. But I know my past has not been as terrible as some of you have dealt with. Some of you came from broken homes. Some of you may not even know who your father is. Some of you may not even know that your dad or mom cares about you. I don't know. But I know who knows. And when you begin to take this walk with Christ, understand that your past really gives you insight to how much God loves you and how much He cares for you. Acts the 10th chapter, verse 43 says this, All the prophets testify about Him, about Jesus, that everyone who believes in Jesus, in Him, receives forgiveness of sins through His name. My friend, listen this morning, there's nothing that you have ever done or ever could do that will keep Jesus from forgiving you. Hello? Yeah. Nothing. You say, well, there's... No, nothing. Because if, you ever done that, if you've ever done that one, you wouldn't be worried about anything. So understand that your salvation perspective you need to understand or see it through what you've been through as a person. Number two, your present position. 
And our present position alerts us and keeps us from the practice and dominion of sin. Where am I now with Christ? It is the privilege of a person-to-person relationship with Jesus Christ. When I walked the halls of high school, I was not an outgoing Christian. I was not one of those that carried my toted my Bible and preached on the corner of the hall or the stairway. But people knew I served God. And oftentimes, I was left alone. When everyone came to that point to where they wanted to do something that they knew that I probably would not do, they walked off and just, they didn't even tell me, they just walked off. Hmm. Hmm. What happened? It hurt. I'm not kidding you. It hurt. I understood that I was being left alone. That's when... Deep down inside, I understood my position. And I said, in my mind, in my heart, thank you, Lord, that you never leave us or forsake us. I began to quote the Word of God. I began to pray, God, help me to understand that I'm not alone. And I made it. I made it. This has happened several years ago, but I was walking up town, and somebody stopped me. He said, are you Steve? Steve Higdon? I said, yeah. He introduced himself. I can't remember his name now, and I didn't know who he was then. But he said, I went to school with you in Burlington. And he said, I always appreciated. I, I, I didn't appreciate it then, but he said, I look back now, and he said, I always appreciate it that you considered yourself a Christian and you lived it. And he said, I'm one now. And he said, I wished I'd have known it when you knew it. Whoa! I was standing all alone? No, I wasn't. Christ was standing there with me and beyond my understanding, He was radiating Himself through me to somebody else. So you understand your past, understand your present. And what's the next one? Your future. What is your future? Matthew, the 25th chapter, I'm going to read two verses, 32 and 33. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. I'm going to ask somebody to do it. And you've got to be quick. But I want someone to stand and quote John 3.16. She did that a couple weeks ago, or last week, one of the two. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have what? Ongoing, everlasting life. Everlasting. In high school, I'd ask a girl out and she said, no, you're a little short for me. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Did my ears twirl? (laughs) Did I go bald? Did I all of a sudden get tall? Down deep in here it hurt. Why? Because the real me is here, in here. My soul. My being. It's not what I'm like on the outside. You've seen somebody that might be beautiful, but they're ugly as... (laughs) 
They're ugly. You may come across somebody that's not very attractive, but when you start a conversation with them, all of a sudden it's like, wow. Because it's in here. The real them. Understand this morning, when we asked Him to forgive us of our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He gave His Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. The real me down in here. I'm going to shed a body. But I'm going to have everlasting life. The real me. That's my future. Now this is kind of dangerous on my part. With that which I have shared with you this morning... What does the first part of our text mean? Hope. Hope. Anyone else? Faith. Help me out. What would she say? Safety. Okay. See, I can't wear this mic and wear my hearing aids. Can you imagine how loud one becomes to themselves? <laughs> Safety. Hope. Faith. What I want us to understand is that Jesus speaks in parables and he was saying salvation is an ongoing process and that understand that as your past and your present and your future in that salvation, it's an everyday experience. You haven't just arrived. I know you may get tired of it, but remember, you turn and you start following the cross and you stumble, you still make progress. Because my faith is in Jesus Christ. It's an ongoing process. There's a scripture that says this. And it's Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. And this is the part I want you to hear. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's an ongoing process. Don't give up. Hello? Amen. Don't give up. I may not get to share with you again, but don't give up. If I can leave any one thing with you, remember, don't give up. You haven't arrived yet, but there's going to come a time when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. Do you know which you are? <laughs> I want a shepherd. A shepherd that cares for the sheep that will leave the 99 and go find that lost one. Because there's still hope. It's an ongoing process. Learn from your mistakes. Understand that you gain experience as you gain experience. After being a Christian and pastoring the years that I've pastored and now not being in ministry full time, there are some struggles that I'm going through. But I've also realized this. As I take the Word of God and I begin to open the Word of God and I begin to think about it, all of a sudden I'm beginning to see things that I was so busy trying to make the next sermon that I was quickly trying to put something together for the church. And I believe many times the Holy Spirit spoke to me and helped me in those times of crisis. But even as I looked at the text that you had given to me, and I looked at this this week and I was thinking about it, 
And I kept wanting to go back to the stony and the wayside and the, and the good ground. And I, no, that's not the text. The text is where the seed is planted and it grows and it grows when we're not doing anything or grows when we are doing something. And then he talks about parables and how Jesus spoke in parables. How does that apply to our salvation? It applies to our salvation because our salvation is an ongoing process. Well, at least the front row agrees with me. <laughs> Let me have a word of prayer with you. Father, I thank you so much for your love, mercy, and grace. I thank you for these people, Lord, that have allowed me to be a part of their lives. But I ask also that just like me, being in different avenues of work, pastoring, restoration, being a farm boy, but not living on the farm, and all those things that are a part of my life, the older I get, the more I understand of the love of Jesus Christ. That while I was yet a sinner, He loved me. I didn't become perfect overnight, and I'm still far from perfect, but He still loves me. And He forgives me. And as I attend church in the morning, and I take that moment of silent reflection, I understand, God, I can stand cleansed because Your forgiveness is alive and real and the real me is renewed in spirit and truth i ask that same relationship be built with these folks that each of them may in the midst of their struggle understand that it is an ongoing process but not to give up to be able to work through the problem that as they look back over the year, they say, you know what, I'm not dealing with that problem anymore because God has led me through it. I'm a winner in the name of Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen.